Hello, good evening and welcome to the third episode of Time Watch 2019. So this is where the students of the British Ecological Society Summer School for 16 to 18 year olds tell you their stories about the things that they've been doing this week. Um, so we're here at the Mallantyne Field Centre and um, it's, it's been a very hot day so we're a little bit sweaty and glowy but we've had such a fantastic day today. Um, probably one of my favourite days and I'm joined by Caitlin, Jasmine, Alice and Anna to talk about one of the things that we did. So um, here's our first picture. Um, Alice, yep. you were in the cave with me today. Um, how yep. was it? Oh, it was really, really interesting. So we walked for about 15 minutes through like the grass mm -hmm. and then we came to a woodland uh -huh. which we had to like walk up and into the cave. So when you first go in it was really like cold and it got like progressively dark as you went through. Mm -hmm. As you we were walking everything just kept getting like narrower and narrower, darker and darker until at the end we were all like crouched in like almost complete darkness. Amazing. Yeah. That sounds incredible and a perfect place to be on a very hot day. Yeah. Um, so what, what can we learn from caves about, I mean we can learn about caves but do they tell us more about the world? Um, yeah like in the cave you can see like the different type of geology and stuff so there was a lot of limestone which was all around the cave and there was like different types of rocks which could help us date back to like, the previous stuff that has happened around there and there was also like previously they found bones from people so they helped that. That's a cave with a history. Yeah. <laughs> and was anything living in the, in the cave now? Yeah, loads was there. So at first we saw two spiders. Right. So oh, have we got one of your pictures of the spiders. This is your picture. Yeah, yeah, that's what I took. Amazing. Um, yeah, we saw spiders, which was cool. They were kind of living on the roofs. And this one's your cave. teacher's picture? Yeah. <laughs> which is really good. That's amazing. We use the um, actual lens. It can be like a fisheye lens. Right. Which zooms in more, so that's why it's really good. Yeah. Yeah, right. And then um, we also saw moths, a tissue. That's a tissue moth there. Mm -hmm. And... That was cool because it's got different patterns that I usually see, like in the woodlands and stuff. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And um, so we saw some animals. Were there indications of animals we didn't see? Yeah, because there was there was um, a dead moth, and it had only left its wings there. Mm -hmm. And it was really cool. and there was hazelnuts as well, where the, where the where birds and animals are taking them in. Oh, right. Really cool. So what what are we seeing in this picture? So is this the what yeah. does that indicate yeah. was there? That would eat the body of the moth and leave the wings behind. So oh, brilliant. It was quite cool to see. Yeah, that's amazing. And what was this one? They're the hazelnut shells. Yeah, right. Which yeah. mice stored in the winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you said at the end it was dark. How dark was it? It was the pitch was dark. It was really dark. You couldn't see anything. Like you wave your hands in front of you and you couldn't see anything. Mm -hmm. It was really cool. You Amazing. Just... And was that scary? A little bit, but it was fine. It was... I wouldn't want to be there by myself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or without a good talk. Yeah. <laughs> the trip. And was it more interesting than scary? Like just yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It, was more it was quite peaceful as well. Like you just sat there. Yeah. And, it was like and you could hear the water like yeah. trickle. Yeah. 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 It was quite nice. Yeah, was and in this sort of pitch blackness, was there any life? Um, well, we saw that we saw some uh, moths and stuff like that, but not there wasn't a lot of animals. Mm -hmm. yeah, so like yeah. small and there's yeah. no flowery plants because mm -hmm. obviously yeah. there's no sunlight. Yeah. So yeah. Right. And it's yeah. really cool. they can't grow. So there was no like. Flowers. Uh -huh. yeah. So I think the last picture we have is some of the life that grows in the dark. Um, if we can switch to that. I thought that was extraordinary. Made yeah. out of all my yeah. favourite bits to say. Yeah. You yeah. know, when I thought nothing would grow, they were, we were yeah. still seeing things that were living. Um, that's brilliant. So, um, are you keen to visit more caves or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's really cool. Like a, a bigger one, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. more things about. Like yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's really cool. Because yeah. yeah. it's got water in it too, so it yeah. be a dry one. Or yeah. 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 Lots of yeah. possibilities. All right. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts about um, uh, coming into the cave. So now we're going to watch an interview that I recorded yesterday with Theran and James, who were two of the lecturers who came in to talk to the students. So I will press play. So two of the things that I particularly enjoyed about this summer school is firstly the number of different academics and teachers who have come in to be involved in this and secondly that um, 
although this is run for UK students and things, that so many of the students and the people who are contributing to the course associate not just with the UK but a lot of other countries as well. So this has been really important to me as I'm a fairly recent immigrant to the UK, I'm Australian. Um, and so now I'm joined um, by Thorin Helgerson and James Chong, and so I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and as part of that tell me what other countries they associate with. So I'll start with you James. Okay, so uh, I'm James Chong. Uh, I'm actually half Chinese by background, uh, but grew up in the UK. Um, undergraduate at the University of York. Mm -hmm. PhD with uh, what was Imperial Cancer Research Fund and is now Cancer Research UK. And then I spent about four years in the US as a postdoc before coming back to the UK. Thank you. So I'm Thorin Helgerson, it's not a British name, you can actually go. Um, <laughs> all my family come from Iceland. Right. Via a bit of Denmark and Yorkshire as well. Mm -hmm. So but I grew up in Edinburgh, don't have an Icelandic accent, you can probably hear that. Um, but I did both my degrees in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. in forestry and tree conservation really. After that I moved to the Natural History Museum in London. So there's a thread running through there about sort of biodiversity and that kind of thing and since then after moving from the Natural History Museum I've been at York ever since. Fantastic. Mm. So why is it important to both of you to contribute to a school such as this for 16 to 18 year olds? Maybe I'll start with you. They're the next generation. Um, everything that we do is now moving so quickly. Um, the methods that we use, the way we look at things, the theories behind them are changing very quickly and I think it's really important to get that across to the students, the prospective students who are thinking about doing degrees in this area, thinking about studying it, inspiring them with the fact that they're not going to be doing um, rehashing old stuff, mm -hmm. they're going to be doing new and exciting things and have a potential really to change how we look at the world completely. Right, thank you. So for me, I think it's about horizons and, and trying to broaden them. And certainly, although it was a long time ago when I was you know, looking at universities, I had a fixed idea about mm -hmm. what a subject involved. And you know, I think particularly the session that we do, hopefully you know, broadens out what ecology can be at, you know, for, for different people. So mm -hmm. spe speaking of your session, um, perhaps you can describe it a little bit for me, but um, I was lucky enough to be part of that and attend it, and um, I think you work so well together. So your session, um, you can tell us a bit about it in a minute, but it involves mm -hmm. the students really literally getting their hands dirty and digging up things beneath their feet. And your session was sort of, and or I guess also about things you could see, students could pick things up in your session was much more about things that are harder to see and that we need tools to help us see uh, more kind of clean lab techniques and the latest technology. So do you want to tell me a bit about what you did with the students today? Mm. Shall I start? Yeah. So the, the theme of the session is the world beneath your feet. Mm -hmm. It's all about how the there is as much biodiversity below ground as there is above ground. We don't know anything about it. We know as little or we know more about the oceans than we do about soils really. Mm. And by literally getting your hands dirty, digging some of it up, getting people to uh, sift through it, see the diversity of root form, see the different types of worms that come out, um, have a look at the different connections and associations that you can actually see there and sort of physically pull it apart and compare how soils can change in character across a very short distance. It's it's real, you know, it's, mm. it's actually get your hands in there and actually see that it is a thing and it's different. But that segues in, I also do DNA work, and then you can sort of say, well, how do we find out who any of these creatures are, what their um, name is, what their interactions are, and then that moves very cleanly into what James does. So what we've been, I've been talking about today is you know, how you understand and track those microbial communities, and how the technology is changing and letting us do that. So, um, you know, a lot of biology or new biological techniques is being driven by consumer electronics and that means that you know new tools are coming to the fore very very quickly they're a lot cheaper than they used to be and a lot more user friendly and accessible and so we particularly were talking about nanopore sequencing which is new technology using very tiny pores to sequence dna 
um, comes in very small, relatively low cost devices that can be used in the field. And, and people are already using them in the field to, to address problems that previously we just couldn't even start to get a grip on. So both the things that you did were, were sort of accessible in terms of sort of low cost devices and sort of bucket and spade sort of stuff initially and then mm -hmm. more tech. Um, why is that accessibility component important? <coughs> For accessibility, it needs to be real to people. These are real world problems. Most of the work I do at the minute is to do with um, biodiversity conservation and agriculture and mm -hmm. soil health. Mm -hmm. And by showing people and, and literally getting their hands dirty and seeing what soils do, then we can start to raise awareness of um, what those problems are and say, you can do this, you can be a part of this. Mm. You know, this is not alien to you. Um, wherever you live, whatever kind of background you're from, agriculture is a difficult sector for people to engage with now because there's not very many people involved in it anymore. And, you know, you've got that whole sort of urban rural divide. Mm. But this is important to everybody and we can all be a part of it. And I think it's that sort of nature of accessibility drawing um, a much more diverse range of people into that discipline, I think, is really important. And all those different perspectives, global, national, urban, rural, all of that is really important to get it right. I agree. Have any well, last words? <laughs> well, I, I completely agree with everything Thora said, but you know, for me it is, particularly what I do, is being able to say to people, look, this technology is available, there are really interesting things that you can do that previously you couldn't mm. do. And I want you know, new students coming in to be able to see what's possible and think about how they could apply that to something else. And, and also start to think about kinds of skills that they might need ahead of time to be able to do that. Yes, I think that's mm -hmm. a very important point. I found your session mm -hmm. fascinating, and I know the students did too. I was walking up to one and said, discovered another new world today, and they went, yep, another one. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You're so a nice interview from some very inspiring teachers and researchers. But James was talking about genetics, and Annika, I saw you approach James afterwards and ask him some questions. Is that one of your interests? Uh, yeah, I do. I'm really interested in genetics, and I've read about kind of how people analyse DNA and when he was talking about his new, like, the invention that they have there, I was really like, amazed by it because it only takes like three hours to do it, whereas usually I thought it would take like a few days. So I asked more questions about like how it works. So he said there's like a paw in the machine and like to imagine how big it is, let's say that is like the size of the paw and then he said like imagine a cell. Mm -hmm. the, like, the size of that cell would be like, you know, the tallest building in the world, that would be the cell. So that's how small the pore is. Wow. So then you put the uh, fluid in, so he put in a sewage bacteria virus fluid into there. Mm -hmm. So what it does uh, is there's like a screen, you know, like on a phone screen, it has pixels on it. So the pixels you can control, so it moves the fluid around and eat. While it's moving around, you can uncode the DNA by like, each base. Well, he said it fits in like two and a half bases, but it does like one base at a time. And then it can like uncode the DNA, and then it's... Well, the one they had, it was connected to a like laptop within it, but you can have just like a normal laptop as well, and it just uncodes it, and then it creates like graphs, mm -hmm. and like just analyzes everything. And he was also saying that, because with like genetics courses now, it's like... Because it's all graphs and it's like all computer based now, it's good to have uh, like some idea of coding as well. Because he was saying that with the results, you need to be able to code it and like be able to understand what it's showing, basically. And uh, that's an amazing summary of what you did in a very short time. That's brilliant. So he was doing real time sequencing, and you're exactly right. So you, you can generate so much data, and then you need to have the ability to to analyse it afterwards. Thank you very much. So I think you feature in this next little video clip that we have and we're just going to watch that now. So we did some insect, like searching for insects, so we thought we'd just have to look at them and just identify what they are, but then we also found out different, like their behaviour and what they do under the microscope and when we were collecting them. Um, we did some bug collecting and we found a common green grasshopper and we looked at it in the microscope and we saw that it was doing, um, it was ventilating, so it was doing 
um, abdominal pumping, which we learn about in biology. Brilliant. So there are clips that we recorded on Tuesday. I'm losing track of what day it is, actually. Um, so these were made by you, Amy, another person who's joining me this evening. Um, so you were sort of saying things that you'd seen in your biology textbook that you've seen in real life? Yeah, um, I think that was really quite cool because it's quite helpful because sometimes if you just look at it on paper and it's an, all you've got is an illustration and like diagrams and sometimes it can be hard to follow but actually seeing the books and seeing how they move it's easier to like understand the processes that go on and how biology works in real life. I was so impressed that you spotted that that's what they're doing and yeah. that's incredible. Um, we've got another little clip here and I was wondering if you could talk through what was happening because we, we've covered so much this week. I think everyone's feeling a bit kind of overwhelmed by all the things you've done and we haven't covered this previously in Tarnwatch so maybe you could talk through this video. Uh, if I press play. Oh, I need to mute that one. What's going on here? Um, so this is Gary and he's from the University of Nottingham and they've recently, with like the advancement of technology, they've been able to um, use 3D printing, which helps them to like piece together um, a 3D model, which is um, white. And that allows you to help analyze the flood risk in certain areas. So this one's a map of Skipton and it's at risk as it's in a um, catchment area which has really steep valley sides mm -hmm. so that means that all the water drains straight into the Leeds Liverpool Canal and it's at a very high risk but sometimes um, if you just look at the 2D OS maps mm -hmm. that we currently have um, it's not as easy to you know you've not got a good visualization and it's harder to understand what's going to happen and um, so this technology can be used to um, help planning development agencies to implement like strategies that they need and um, target areas which are most at risk of flooding. Mm. Um, yeah, it works by a projector at the top right. and it um, shines down the light and um, it projects all the colour and the landscape onto there and you can change the settings as well mm -hmm. to show like how the water's moving and areas um, which are most likely to be flooded. Extraordinary. I mean, that's just amazing. <laughs> a very, a very extraordinary thing. Um, so we're sort of recapping some of the things we've done earlier in the week. And another thing I wanted to revisit with you, Sandas, was um, what we did. Was it last night? Uh, yeah. Do you want to tell us what you were doing? Um, so last night, what we did was set up some cameras so mm -hmm. we could catch some um, um, nocturnal mam mam mammals. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we got cameras and we put them in two different sites. One um, site we put some cameras in the woodlands right. just to uh, try and see some big animals like deer or foxes. And then we got another uh, the other set of cameras we went and put it in like a grassy area. And this is to see like small animals like rabbits and mice and stuff like that. So um, what how the cameras work is it's a motion and heat detector so if an animal was to run past it it will quickly take a picture uh -huh. which is kind of cool yeah <laughs> but um should we should we have a look at some of the pictures yeah. you saw so maybe you can talk us through what's in this one oh um, is that that would be a hedgehog yeah and mm -hmm. um, this one a blackbird. And the final one, what else? I think this was the most common thing you saw. Yeah, it's a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so not the deer and things, but there was certainly a lot of stuff out at night that we wouldn't see otherwise, I suppose. Did you see anything else when you were setting up the traps? Uh, yeah, we, we were sitting on the table and we saw some bats fly out. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of strange because in the books they seemed much bigger and like the long wings and, you know, but they were tiny and they just looked like little birds um, when they flew past. So that's very similar to your experience, where things that you sort of read about when you see them, it's, it, it sort of either reinforces an idea or you think, oh, they look so much bigger or smaller than they feel in the thing. So uh, that's great. Um, very, very quickly, what's your favourite thing this week? Um, what did you enjoy? The river thing. Uh huh. I forgot, and you know, where you catch all the stuff in the river. Oh, yeah, the kick sampling in the river. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That. yeah. I, really, I really like the cave in because. Um, I was quite nervous at first, but then 
I went in and it was up. It was up. It wasn't scary at all. Like I, I really enjoyed it. Have you done any Um, I like the the cameras. Like when we put it out to catch the mammals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much for sharing your perspectives. So now we're going to uh, watch some very uh, quick time lapses of the um, of going out to see the caves today. So um, the girls in the first section gave a great description of going to see the caves and we're just going to play a couple of little time lapses to show that. And here's another one. So this is a beautiful picture of the Yorkshire Dales um, and you'll be able to see a group of students wandering past here. They're very speedy. <laughs> um, and the last picture I wanted to show you uh, was again the group of girls from the first section. So um, everybody's uh, been having some selfies uh, in front of these uh, a uh, screen from the British Ecological Society just to record that we've been here. So um, it's this room is getting extremely hot, so you can see I'm pretty hot and sweaty. Um, so thank you very much for the patience of my guests um, in managing these conditions. So my final guests are um, Shalika and Rabia and Zubda, who are going to talk about sort of We've talked about all the sort of great things we've done, but what does that mean for students? But I've, um, so uh, Shalika is a teacher who has brought students here both last year and this year. But I've been doing a lot of talking and asking a lot of questions, so I'm going to hand over to Ramia. So you mentioned that you came here last year with mm -hmm. some students on the same summer school trip. What do you think was the biggest impact on them? Um, we did have, so a lot of the students um, where my school's in a very urban area, a lot of the students hadn't really thought very much about plants, plant ecology, and hadn't really considered it as an option or even something they'd be interested in studying. Um, and by the time we left, there were actually quite a few of them who were considering sort of changing the degrees that they were looking at so that they may do degrees that had broader options that may allow them to pick additional, mo um, additional uh, modules that might allow them to study some ecology. Because I think it just kind of demystified the entire sort of demystified the entire subject for them. Um, what advice would you give to students thinking about coming to the summer school? Um, do it. That is number one. <laughs> um, is yes and I would definitely say um, for them to do it because I think there are the um, um, so many different things that you get to do here that otherwise that in a lot of situations you wouldn't get to do and um, like one of the girls said earlier, although there will be things that may push you out of your comfort zone, like climbing up a hill, going inside a cave, um, number one, now you can say you've done it, um, and number two, it will, like I said, um, give you experiences that when it comes to things that you're studying, um, whether it's things in exams or just things that you may take an interest in in general, um, that will have an impact on their lives further along. Did you have any other questions for Shalika? So um, today, what did you enjoy like the most? Um, I think for me, the caves today, definitely. Um, potentially looking forward to the bat walk this evening as well. As, um, when we went last time, was absolutely amazing. And um, just having that extra, um, having that additional thing to add to um, for these guys that when we're teaching, things for them to look, think back on about memories and things that they can then link their knowledge to it makes a really big difference. Amazing. So can I ask you two, for your perspectives on, on this week, what were some of the things that you were you enjoyed or that you learned? I really enjoyed the caves as well because it was so much fun to go in and see like all the different like it was so much darker in there and cooler and it's such a different climate even though it's like two, three metres away from the trees and like outside but I also enjoyed like the morning like we did bird walks and like we went out in the morning that was really fun as well because you got to like like I never knew about like did, like I knew there were different trees but I never knew like how to identify them and now it's like oh I can say oh that's an ash tree and that's an oak tree or something and also like birds and mammals as well that was really fun. As a plant ecologist, that makes my heart sing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Zim? Um, well, I enjoyed the caves as well because like, the 
difference in like the temperature as well because it was like really hot outside mm -hmm. and then like inside it was like really cold but like it was really nice as well like really peaceful and then uh -huh. I also loved like capturing insects and then looking like looking inside like using a microscope it was really interesting uh-huh that's brilliant so what would you two say to a student who their teacher had said you should go to this and I said, oh, I don't really know. What would your advice be? Maybe it was something you things with that. Um, like, really go for it, because it's always good, like, looking for, like, because there's always, like, much. It doesn't really ever get boring. Mm-hmm. They keep you busy, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say 100% do it, just because, like, it's nerve-wracking at first, because obviously you don't know who else is going. Mm -hmm. Um, But, like, like what you were saying before, like, it might be scary, but at least you can say you've done it, like climbing up the hill to get to the cave. It was like scary going up like the rocks. You and did choose about the hardest day. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, <laughs> it was really slippy as well. So it was like, it was scary, but it was like, at the end of it, it was really fun. And like, we learned loads as well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. And so as a teacher, I've learned a lot this week. Have you found the same? Yes, definitely. I think even compared to the last year, this year, there's still loads of stuff that I've learned. But now, have, and a lot of things that have changed the way that we teach plant-based stuff back at school, especially because, mm -hmm. um, well, we don't have this on our doorstep. True. Um, so, <laughs> sort of some things to adapt, but even just having been here, just sort of, you know, helping to change perceptions about plants, um, ecology, and in general, the environment. Mm. Um, and making sure that students understand the level of impact that they can have, even just doing or changing small things at home, yeah. changing small things at school, for example. Yes. Well, I mean, you mentioned so there was a bit of, um, you feel a bit apprehensive when you come because there's lots of students yeah. from lots of schools. As I've said a couple of times, we've got 31 students from seven different schools. I think you've met students from five schools yeah. in this. Um, has that been, what's that been like meeting other students? It was fine because students? like, on the first day you got to sort of, on the first and second day you were sort of getting to know everyone because everyone's like, from all different places, like literally people from like eight hours away or something. It's like you really get to know more about the other person, like where they live and stuff. So it wasn't like it was fine at first because everyone's sort of in the same boat, like everyone's yeah. trying to get to know each other. Yeah. So it was fine. Yeah. What else should we mention about this school that someone might like to know? Is there anything else that you'd bring up or think about? Uh, um, I was going to say the insects as well, because yes. like, mm. and the soil sampling as well, mm -hmm. because you'd go outside and you'd just like pick like, not even a handful of soil, uh -huh. like it's like a like, tiny amount, and you put it in the microscope, you expect to see like practically nothing, but there's so many different things, I think it just makes you really aware of everything, because it's like, you never notice how many different things you're seeing, and mm -hmm. like how many different species of everything there are. Because um, in one of the talks she was saying like there's like more than like 10,000 moths or something and it's like you just look at them like it's one thing. Yes. You know, really pay attention. And suddenly when you go there's so many different yeah. things out there. Yeah. Um, I was thinking also about the role of the mentors this week. So I sort of about, talked about the students and, and the teachers and there's been a whole range of mentors who have also been yeah. teachers. So did you want to comment a bit on the role of the mentors and... and what they've meant to you or what role they've played? They're like really like informative in regards to like ecology especially because that's what they've like really specialised in as well mm -hmm. but then like other careers so it makes you like open to like all sorts of different things mm -hmm. which you could like get into even if like really restricts is like one, one thing in your mind and then it's like you've opened to like all sorts yeah and it's really like interesting because it's like you should like consider everything mm -hmm. That's brilliant. The amazing perspective. I've had such a brilliant week and it's been fantastic to hear how you found things as well. So I think we're nearly out of time, so I'll wrap up. Um, a lot of thank yous. So uh, it's very hot today and it's been a huge week. So I think, um, but uh, a jam-packed one, jam-packed full of activities, jam-packed full of learning. Um, I think that uh, I hope I'm reflecting what students have learnt, but I think we've learnt a lot about the world around us. I think we've learnt a lot about ourselves. I've seen enormous amounts of support from one student to the other, both people they already knew and people they didn't. The support between the students and teachers has been extraordinary, and I think the teacher support between all of the tutors um, has been uh, amazing as well. 
So I think we've learned about uh, a lot of ecology careers and all the different options um, about ourselves and of course a whole lot about ecology here at Mallantyne at the Field Studies Centre. So we're coming to the end of the British Ecological Society Summer School for 16 to 18 year olds for 2009 and I'll sign out there. I'm Julia. Thank you. Bye.